Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris. Welcome to Life Questions, a program designed to address your many questions and issues about life from a biblical perspective. This week we're continuing our focus on the youth with a concentration on the questions submitted by parents and teens. We've brought together a panel of local pastors who have reviewed your questions carefully with prayer to give us their answers and I'd like for you to meet them at this time. We have first of all Phil Starr of the Lima Community Church, where he is youth pastor, followed by Landon Stapleton of Harvest Baptist in Wapakoneta, and he is the director of youth ministries there. Pastor Andrew Rode of Calvary Chapel of Praise, his title is family pastor. And then we have Tori Breitigan, who is from the First Church of New Knoxville. She is a youth and children's pastor there. Thank you for being with us today. Now, this is a... This is a real sticky issue here, and it's one that um, I don't think some churches want to deal with, and that is the issue of sexuality. And as that issue floods our country, uh, it's also having an effect on our young people. Mm -hmm. uh, young people are now saying, some are now saying that um, they're either atheists or they want to change their gender in terms of identity they like. Have you been experiencing this at all in, in, in your ministries? And if so, how, how do you address it? How do you deal with it? You want to go first, Pastor Stark? Well, yeah, I'm not wise well. <laughs> uh, so I think, I, you know, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, we have seen an increase in uh, these type of conversations mm -hmm. happening in our, in our local congregations where, you know, 20 years ago when I was a youth pastor, these weren't the issues that we were talking about. And... Uh, and, and there's some things about these situations with sexuality and gender dysphoria that are similar and there's things that are also unique. And I think that's one of the hardest things about being a youth pastor is how do you work out which things are similar issues and which things are unique issues. And, and then sexuality is a very sensitive topic, not only is a big part of like our experience of life, but you know, culturally it's just a big, big topic now. We have to figure out how to navigate these things with, with grace with love and with truth, and it's always a challenge for us. And those three are very key, aren't they? Grace and love and truth. Yeah, very much what so. What a combination. Very much so, yeah. <laughs> Takes a lifetime. Uh-huh, uh -huh. yeah. it does indeed. Yeah. What else? Uh, Pastor uh, Bredigan, right? I, yes. I, I, I mispronounced it, I'm sorry, before Pastor <laughs> Bredigan. Uh, tell us, from a female standpoint, as you're dealing with these issues, yeah. how, do, how, do you, how do you address it? How do you approach it? Absolutely, yeah. So it is definitely an issue that I think we're all facing in different ways. Um, I think for me as a youth pastor, when that comes up, um, the best response um, is to show that student love first and foremost, because anybody that's a part of the LGBTQ community um, is already feeling like they're unloved or unaccepted, especially in the church too. I know I've had friends that have um, come out as gay or whatever, and they do not feel accepted in the church. Yeah. They don't feel loved by the church. And so for me, my first reaction is I love you. Yeah. regardless of where you come from or how what you're dealing with right now I love you no matter what that's the message that I think gets lost mm -hmm. does it yeah. not whether you agree with the lifestyle or not Christ certainly didn't agree with the lifestyle that the woman caught in adultery was living mm. but he showed her love absolutely uh, and there are other examples of course so absolutely. yeah, yeah you're, you're right you're right and I think uh, Pastor Fell you were talking about the truth I think a lot of people a lot of the members of that community get truth um, but it is in the harshest and rudest yeah, of ways definitely. and so the grace and the love is so important for all of us as youth pastors to approach the, these situations with because there really is is no easy way to address it, um, but we can address it like Christ would have, and he would have said, I love you first. Yeah, you think about Jesus, two things that, uh, there's a pastor on our staff, and one of the things that he said a long time ago was that Jesus was really crucified for his radical hospitality mm -hmm. and his radical call to holiness. Mm -hmm. You know, he reminded those who, who thought that, that they were very holy that the holiness that God calls us to, a holiness of love and selflessness, is really a very high calling mm. that says, that puts everything else second to knowing Jesus. Yes. But then the hospitality of Jesus is extremely radical. You think about, um, think about the people that Jesus went to, like the woman caught in adultery, mm. and how 
uh, he would reach out to people that the world and even the people of God would say, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And he would remind them that there is a place for you. And the one thing that I'm continually reminded as a pastor and as, a, as really a Christian, a Christ follower, is the fact that uh, we don't get to choose when the Holy Spirit speaks to somebody's life. Yes. And it would be nice for the Holy Spirit to speak to everybody that, that was just like us in the same season of life as us. Mm -hmm. But we don't choose that. And God calls us as shepherds to walk with people uh, and walk through their journey with them as the Holy Spirit works mm -hmm. in their life and walks with them as well. So it's, it's, it's but it's messy. Mm -hmm. It's messy. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I would imagine it's risky because it, it becomes a political issue. Mm -hmm. Not that Christians mm -hmm. should make it a political issue, but it becomes a political issue because of the social identification. And it, it's, it's, in, it's well, politically correct, the politically correct thing mm -hmm. to do, that kind of situation. How then, and we're dealing with young people, how do we deal with that issue of being politically correct, which a lot of times is incorrect in terms of what the Bible has to say, but at the same time show the love that you were talking about, mm -hmm. you know? How, how do we address that issue? That person needs to know, one, that God loves them the way they are. Mm -hmm. Not with the lifestyle, but I'm saying he loves them as, as his created beings, but he wants you to come to him so he can change you nonetheless. Mm -hmm. He wants to change all of us, yeah. not just people who have sexual identity issues. He wants to change yes. all of us when we come to him. How so, do you get that across? I, so I think, I, and you all can definitely, you know, chime in whenever you want to. But I think if you, when we start taking sexuality serious as a church, mm -hmm. then it really affects more than just the, uh, the sexual orientation area. I mean, we have to take marriage serious. We have to take celibacy serious. We have to celebrate singleness mm -hmm. in a way that brings value to people who have chosen to be single and not get married. And a church has not done this well. We have made somehow the sexual climax, a man and a woman in marriage, like what it means to be biblically true. And the reality is sexuality is part of who we are, but the marriage relationship isn't the climax of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. It's relationship with God is the climax. Yeah. And then that really leads us into a lot of different, you know, it, it provides a really high calling of sexuality, which is really always, everything's always submitted to that relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Everything's always submitted to the relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. You haven't said anything up till now. Yeah, this, everything they're saying is so good. I, I um, yeah, they're saying it all. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say um, w when spearheading sexuality that um, I, I think that there's a, a way to, um, to address issues like pornography, mm -hmm. but I know it's very difficult when you don't want to, you don't want to educate people on evil. Um, so you have to somehow address it in a way um, that you're not revealing to someone for the first time that hopefully, you know, maybe doesn't know what that is. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And you're like, you know, we shouldn't do this. And they're like, gonna go explore or something. You know what I mean? So um, being sensitive, but you have to, you can't shy away from it mm -hmm. because it's so rampant and mm. it just, it's distorting um, our, our sexuality and um, our perception of sexuality. Mm. Yeah. So. I think one of the tougher messages has to be the fact that because it is disobedience to God, it leads to your destruction. Mm -hmm. And trying to get that message across without seeming to be judgmental and saying that God loves you and the reason he wants to save you from it is because it's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. Not to say that other sins aren't, mm -hmm. but that's another one that is. Mm -hmm. um, does that... Does that amount to the way we word it then? Uh, so that mm. I think I've, I've seen that and, and even when I was growing up in youth group and, and our tendency is to react like sexual sin is the only real sin there is. Like oh, everything right. else is okay. As long as, <laughs> as long as you're not having sex, yeah. then everything else is okay. And yeah. we don't talk about pride and arrogance wow. and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm worry and mm -hmm. greed and that we, we skip everything else as long as, as we keep them from having sex and we've done our job kind of thing, almost uh, and, and you know there and maybe there is things in scripture where we'd say maybe sexual sin has more consequences to it and and paul has a very strong stance on on those kind of things but um you know, maybe we've almost glorified it in some ways mm -hmm. with the way we've talked about it and oh. it's become you know the worst thing you could do, therefore, the thing we get them to, you know, as soon as you tell a, a teenager you can't do that, 
What do they want to do? Off we exactly go. the thing you <laughs> just told them go. not to do. And, and yeah. so that, it makes it a difficult topic to discuss. It, and as you're saying, we don't want to educate on, on it, but they are being educated on it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, the, the world is talking about it. And a lot of times I think in church, we shy away from it maybe. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to bring that stuff up. And so someone, they're getting their information from somewhere and they're talking about it with somebody. And, and so, you know, I think it needs to be the church. It need, we need mm -hmm. to not be afraid mm -hmm. of it. Um, we need to be able to, to talk about it and to give the, the right biblical perspective of saying, you know, no, we don't hate people who live a contrary yes. lifestyle. Yeah. You know, these are people who need to know Jesus, you know, mm. with any kind of anything else, you know, we'd say the gospel message is kind of the answer for this. Mm. Uh, so it's not, oh, we hate you, we push them away, but you know, how do we discuss this and maybe get into it before it becomes, once a student has come out and said, I identify as this, it's, it's really hard to then reach them because they, they tend to be a little more set. And, and so maybe if the, we have a culture of being able to talk about this before it ever gets to that point, yeah. maybe I think we can do a little bit mm -hmm. a better job and not shy away from it until it's become a big issue yeah. or the, this person's come out or the parent is telling us this. And, yeah. and so, so I said so, a lot there to me. So I don't so know if a, I said anything. So here's a, one of the things I, I think we look at in the church and uh, we look at the church in a way sometimes that it's more of a boundary where uh, you can't come be a part of the community of God until you've crossed the boundary and experienced the conversion, right? I think, that's, I think that we're wrong in that way. I think the community of God is a, is a means of grace. And, and that, what that means is that the community of God is a place where we're learning to wrestle with God. You know, I think about, I think, I think about Israel, right? The name Israel was given because it's a people that wrestle with God. And we wrestle with God, and the community is to be a place where people from all, all life backgrounds and can wrestle with what it means to know God and to be mm -hmm. His people. And I think sometimes we've gotten so, we fought so much over the boundary that we've really done a disservice to the world and, uh, and our churches. Wow. Mm -hmm. But we need to see the community as a means of grace where people can walk in and they have the freedom and the grace to explore who God is. Uh, while recognizing that we, once again, the Spirit is walking with us at different stages mm -hmm. in our life. You yeah. know? Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break, come All back, right. because there's more discussion to be had here. So don't you dare touch that dial. We'll be back <laughs> momentarily. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we've got all youth pastors that are here today. And how can we talk about the problems of youth without getting into um, heterosexual, heterosexual sexual issues as well? Um, this is a question we got in from a viewer. Um, I am being pressured by my boyfriend to have sex. I don't want to, but I also don't want to lose him. That's a legitimate, that's a legitimate thing that a child has to face. I mean, we, as adults, we may look at that and say, huh. No big deal, no, but <laughs> to a child, that is a big deal. How say you, what, what do you do in addressing that child with that type yeah. of an issue? Mm. Should I start with a female first? Sure. <laughs> 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 oh, well, you know, it's really easy for us as adults um, that have been in relationships and are married and things like that to say, well, just lose the boyfriend. You know, it's really easy. <laughs> um, but for a teenager, it's not necessarily that easy. Wanting um, to belong. Wanting yeah, to they want to belong. They want to feel loved. All of those things. Um, you know, if my first response is if they're really pressuring you, that's a form of abuse. Too. You know, you if they will not say no, that is a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but the other response to that is that sex does not equal love. Mm -hmm. And that's really important that's for teens to hear is that mm -hmm. sex does not equal love. Um, and that if this girl um, thinks to keep her boyfriend, um, to keep him loving her, that she has to have sex with him, um, that's never 
probably never going to happen, you know, and it's going to lead to a lot of unhealthy things in oh, a relationship yeah. um, and potentially a lot of baggage for her to carry with her into other relationships as well. Um, okay. So it's really tricky, but yeah. I do think it's something that we as youth pastors should be addressing um, because they talking don't, about. Because they don't look into the future, like you said, no. all the baggage that is to come. They're looking at the here and now, mm -hmm. yeah. which is uh, just just the way young people think. Yeah. So wh what, what do you do? I mean, obviously, if a child tells you this, do you hold this in confidence because you're the youth pastor? How do you, how do you approach this kind of a deal? Because if you tell the parents, then there's breaking the confidence that you have with that child. I mean, what goodness, it's, mm -hmm. that's very, very sticky. Um, yeah. Everybody's kind of shaking their head <laughs> in agreement with what yeah, I just yeah, said. I, but I, I think as a youth pastor, though, you're always trying to work in concert with parents. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you do want to tell parents. And even maybe you have to tell the parents, you know, they told me this. This was, you know, in confidence that they told me this, but we mm -hmm. think you need to know. Uh, and, and a difficult thing with this is we can tell kids, you know, all everything that you were just saying, and there's going to be consequences down the road. And we kind of talked before when, when we were talking about, you know, God isn't our cosmic killjoy, that he's not just here mm -hmm. to ruin your fun in life, but that he tells us things and he gives us commands and, and he gives us promises with those that if you do it his way, it works out so much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, you can tell a student that too, like, hey, God's way is is designed to be for our, our better, for our joy. This will work out better in your life if you do it His way. But at some point, that student has to buy into that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. a, that's I think the most difficult part because you can it tell is. them all the right answers, and at some time they have to come up with that too. They have to accept that and follow that. So, yeah, I think I think you got to work with the parents. You can you got to tell them you know the consequences, the danger. And then you just got to pray really hard, too, because yes. it's got to be God yeah. working in them, too, because Absolutely. at some point they have to decide, I'm going to accept this, I'm going to believe this, I'm going to do what's right. And so I think you got to be praying for them. And, and there's a lot of pressure and danger out there with, with kids having sex and sex before marriage and, and the pressure that's there. Mm -hmm. And so I think you got to be praying for them. Mm -hmm. I'd like right to say, uh, I think, you know, all these teenagers are looking for like a form of, of validation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, reading a uh, book called uh, Wild Up at Heart. Um, mm -hmm. And he, in the book, he said that um, there's a, an internal question that men and women ask. And he said, you know, men are, are like, their internal question is, you know, do I have what it takes? And a female is asking, um, do, am I worthy of being pursued? And there's like these kind of internal questions that we kind of subconsciously ask. And we're trying to, to make sure that, or they're trying to, to function in a way that like, I ensure that this question's answered, but yeah. um, they're going they're going about it the wrong way. And mm -hmm. so I'd say, um, you know, as we're trying to give them that truth, that they need to to know, um, as we said in our past discussion, that their just their value and how um, within God's plan for them, um, like not only is it the best for them, but it's it's designed because they they are valuable. And when you you know when you have like a precious jewel. You don't just kind of like sit it out uh, for anybody to just kind of throw it around the room and, and play football with it. Uh, <laughs> but you like you lock it up and and you put it on display so that people can cherish it. But they have if they want to be a part of, in and partake in that valuable thing, you know, they have to um, invest in that. They have to, um, you know, they have to purchase that. And there's yeah. there's a, a route that God gives us That's right. for that, you know, so. Um, mm. Yeah, it yeah, sounds, it sounds like that. in the question, like, that this person's wavering, right? They say, mm -hmm. you know, they feel pressured, they don't want to. And so, I mean, I, I agree fully with what you're saying, Tori. You know, you, you, at some point, no means no, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then on this other side, I think what we're talking about is this, is this reality that it's okay to say no. Like, mm -hmm. bring them to a place where uh, what they see in the world is normal is, is doesn't have to be their normal, yeah. right? Like you talked about this, like this is what everybody's about right now, right? Sex, se sexual, like it's it sexuality is everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's on the commercials, and so we need to get them to a place where they realize this this isn't this does not have to be the normal life that that you mm -hmm. buy into. This there's there's a different kind of life that God has for us. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what I hear you talking about, Andrew. Yeah. Is the yeah. the vision of life. And I think there's a really 
helpful way to approach that too is you know the purity movement was a huge movement back in like the 90s and 80s and all of that um but now it, and the purity movement was like don't have sex sex is bad because god says sex is bad but really sex is a beautiful thing created by god with boundaries for a reason and i know for us in our youth group we've been trying to teach uh, sexual purity, sexual integrity, even great, more uh, so, great, great, of nice. saying like, you know, it's not just about the act of sex. It's about your mind, what you're looking at. You know, pornography, as you were mentioning earlier, talking to kids about those things and giving them the biblical perspective of saying, here's why sex is beautiful, but here's why it's so powerful too. Mm -hmm. And you need to yeah. be careful and you uh -oh. need to be wise in how, how you um, engage in relationships um, and what does it look like to have sexual integri integrity over all of your life instead of just the act of sex too. Yeah. Very good, that, that's powerful, that, that's very powerful. And I hope, I hope they grasp it. Mm. Uh, that mm. message needs to go out universal to, to mm. young people everywhere. But look at, look at all the sexploitation. Uh, I was telling you all earlier that I performed a wedding in Thailand several months ago and as we were going through the city, we were in Phuket, Phuket, Phuket it's called, which is the second largest city there. It's second only to uh, Bang Bangkok, I think it is. Is it Bangkok? I think it's Bangkok. I won't trust you on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is in Thailand. Yeah, yeah. but, 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 but we, we, we had to stay away from certain areas because they have children, mm. s children being th that are being sold, their bodies are being sold mm. for sex. And mm. they, they take them early on and they brainwash them into this, you know, and put them on the market. And so it, the earlier we can get to our young people about human sexuality, I guess the, the better, we, better we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to turn to another area here that's very important. This is a question we got in the mail. Some parents have chosen not to allow their teens to attend youth groups because they feel too many youth groups lack spiritual depth and are merely glorified social club opportunities. <laughs> well, I've never heard that one. I've never heard that one. But how say you on that? <laughs> You know, I think, I think the one thing I would say, and you all can agree with me or not, is that we're never perfect, mm -hmm. right? Our youth ministries aren't perfect youth ministries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've never been to a church that hits the sermon out of the park every weekend. No. And I never, you know what I mean? It doesn't mess up every once in a while on Sunday morning service. And we would never say that that's the excuse that we just need to leave. And, uh, and so the power of youth ministry for me isn't the perfected like program it's really what happens in those moments, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think that we do have to, as youth pastors, we have to strive for excellence mm -hmm. uh, in all ways, but at the same time, we need grace as well to say, you know what, sometimes we just don't, sometimes life happens mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. we don't always hit it out of the park, you know? Mm -hmm. what, what are y'all's thoughts on that, on, on the power of the youth ministry? I think, and, and we've talked about this a little bit and, and just, the amount of time that we get to spend with a student compared to, you know, parents or school, and, mm. and we only get just such a small time each week mm. to spend with them. That's not enough time to develop someone's faith into every, you know, teach them everything they need to know. And, and so, you know, you, you can hit certain things, but a lot of what, I don't know, what I'll, I'll try to do and, and a lot of what I hope youth group can do is, you know, how do we get kids to make faith their own? I don't know that we can yeah. give them everything they need. You know, hopefully parents are giving them that, you know, grandparents, whoever it is who is, you know, spending more time with them is that yeah. spiritual influence in your life. But then, uh, you know, we, we've discussed statistics of what, what happens when kids head off to college after being in youth group. A lot of them are, you know, turning away from the faith and, uh, you know, coming back from college and, you know, not, not, following, not following Christianity or totally rejecting it all together. And how do we get kids to, to take that faith and, and make it their own mm -hmm. is really what I think. And so, yeah, you wish you had the time to, to just tell them everything they needed to know, but you really don't. So what can you give them to, to really help them? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a hard question because, I mean, first of all, it kind of gets right at what we do for a job. You know, you almost take that personally a little bit. But, you know, just I don't know that we have enough time that we can do that. We're, we're just here to assist. We're here to help. We want to join in with parents. We want to, you know, maybe be that, that person who if a kid doesn't want to ask their parents a question, they can come to us and things like that. I don't know that we have the time to fully give them everything they need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hope we're giving them what we can. Yeah. But as you're saying, we can't be perfect. We can't yeah. be everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we can help. But, yes. um, okay, yeah. very well said, very well said. I don't know if we're gonna do this enough justice with the limited time we have, but uh, my parents are divorced. 
I spent part of my time with one parent, part with the other, mm -hmm. and I don't like having to live my life like this. I don't choose, I didn't choose for my parents to get divorced. Why am I suffering? Mm -hmm. That's from the child. Why am I suffering? Mm -hmm. And I know this personally from coming from a divorced family. What, what are you going to say? It's hard because I, I, I come from a divorced family as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember struggling with those same emotions. I didn't choose this. I didn't choose to spend holidays apart. I didn't choose to spend time with one and not the other. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, mm -hmm. um, that's not what I wanted. And the reality is, is that it's not fair. It is not fair um, for that kid, but it is a reality of a lot of our students. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a sad reality, but I've heard this quote before, if you can suffer in the right direction. And so if you are suffering, suffer towards God. Help point your kids to God mm -hmm. um, instead of, you know, trying to find different things to put band-aids over that hurt. I like the way you put it the first time. Suffer in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Never heard it like that. Excellent. Oh. Excellent. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, my wife just came through breast cancer this mm. past year. Oh, really? And one of the things that we were trying to teach our kids was the same thing. Uh, we didn't choose suffering. We don't believe that God put this in our pathway. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. we want to walk through the suffering, our reality, in a way where God transforms us and makes us more like Jesus yeah. in those moments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's one of the things you have to learn. You have to learn that even if God didn't make the suffering happen, and, and we don't believe that God calls this family to be divorced, right. but mm -hmm. we believe right. that God is present, He's with you, uh, one of the most powerful things for us walking through suffering, and I'll, I'll be interested for you, Tori, if it's the same thing, mm -hmm. was the formational community of the church. Oh, absolutely. And just, you know, realizing that mm -hmm. the power of our youth group isn't in the programs. Yeah. Programs are just excuses to build a community around God's Word. Yep. And that's what we're doing, trying to do. We're trying to create a community where the new normal was being in God's image yes. and learning to live that way. Is that, is that kind of how you feel like was the most powerful things for you? Oh, absolutely. If I didn't have my youth group, I don't think I'd be here today. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it was a tough, it was a tough time, but it just speaks to the power of relationships and it relationships does. outside of the family, um, especially when messy family situations are happening, um, yeah. are some of the best relationships that you can have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. You, Cordy? Yeah, I would just, uh, I'd say, um, uh, I would just encourage that that teenager to just be to reach out. And I know it's hard. Mm. Um, my parents uh, were separated for a time in my life, and there was a lot of like, I, I, if I, you know, pray hard enough, uh, mm -hmm. I'll fix mm -hmm. this or somehow mm -hmm. this is my fault. Or when somebody's like, you have your friend over and they're like, hey, you know, where's your, your other parent? And you're like, oh, I, I would literally lie to them. You know, they're at mm -hmm. work and, uh, cause I was ashamed and yeah. somehow I accredited it, that to my, on my plate. And um, uh, I would just encourage them to, to reach out to someone and, um, and not to be ashamed because it's, it's not, it isn't their fault. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And on that we're going to have to end it. Uh, thank you very much. It, uh, it gives me some painful reminders of uh, my life similar to yours. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I had nothing to do with it, but um, I had to live through it too. But I'm, I'm going to remember going forward, like you just said, you, you've got to suffer. How did you put it? Suffer, suffer in the right direction. Suffer in the right direction. I love it. Love it. Very well put. Well, that's our program for today. We thank you for being with us. And again, of course, you know we're here faithfully every week. So begin, be sure that is to tune in again next week so you can be with us. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.